Seeing Carolyn Jones deliver one of the best macabre, blood-curdling and spookiest performances in movies has kept fans wondering for years, how come she's so dark? In this video, we will take a deep look at Carolyn Jones's actual life and reveal some shocking secrets and events that will provide you with answers to this burning question. Where does this mesmerizing, mysterious woman get her dark inspiration from? Let's get started. Carolyn Sue Jones was born on April 28, 1930, in Amarillo, Texas. Her parents were Julius Alfred Jones, a barber, and Chloe Jeanette, a homemaker who had a fear of being in crowded places. Carolyn, even as a child, was able to tell stories and entertain people. It was very clear that she had a gift few possess. But the family was living in the Great Depression, and her father was facing a lot of difficulty providing for his family. Her parents' relationship was nearing a certain end, and one day, Julius Alfred Jones packed his belongings and abandoned his two little girls and his wife. Carolyn's mother, who couldn't leave the house, was scared to leave the house, so she couldn't even get a job to feed herself and her children. So, she took her children and went to stay with her grandmother and step-grandfather. At first, it felt good to Carolyn, but as times went by, her grandparents' humble abode soon became crumpled. She, her sister and mother had to rely on their step-grandfather for support, but the old man was prone to sudden outbursts of anger, which would frighten Carolyn. It became so serious, she would hid and lock herself in a room because of fear. Carolyn suddenly became critically sick from a lung infection, and her condition became life-threatening, which caused her to be bedridden at a time. She couldn't go to school like other children and was subjected to being tutored at home. She even categorizes it as doing mental activities rather than physical. Because of her fragile health, she was not allowed to go out to play or see movies, so she turned to movie magazines and listening to music for solace. She soon developed an interest for acting. Even her mother was a huge fan of the entertainment industry, this created some awareness in her daughters about Hollywood. So much so that she named her daughters after her favorite actresses, Carolyn after actress, Carol Lombard and Carolyn's sister, Bet after actress Betty Davis. Carolyn began craving to attend the prestigious Pasadena Playhouse to become an actress. But her step-grandfather didn't support her, but insisted she went to Southern Methodist University to either become a lawyer or doctor but she wouldn't yield to her grandfather's instructions and refused to do his bidding. So her grandfather took her to the university himself to enroll her with the hope she would change her mind. But Carolyn decided to be dramatic so her grandfather could hear her plea. She plunked herself on the steps of the rotunda, sobbing and begging him to allow her to apply to the Pasadena Playhouse. Luckily for her, and fortunately for us, he agreed. She was admitted into the Pasadena Playhouse at the age of 17 in 1947. Although her grandfather was paying for her fees, Carolyn also worked part-time as a good standby performer at the Rings Theatre. She would later replace the star who had left to get married. While she was still in school, she met and fell in love with one of her male counterparts in school, Don Donaldson, in August 1949, and after dating for less than a year, the couple tied the knot in 1950. Their relationship raised an eyebrow because of their age difference. Carolyn was 19 at the time, and Don was 27 years old, which changed the narrative of their romance to a predatory tale. The relationship didn't last, and the couple divorced a year after. Heartbroken Carolyn picked up her pieces together and focused more on her studies and acting, and she graduated a star student from school. But the difficulty of the labor market soon hit hard on her. Then she realized her talents and good grades alone were not sufficient to get her a good spot in the movie industry. So she had a head-toe transformation that was painful and expensive to suit the standard of beauty in the film industry. This she did for the sake of her career. She opted to undergo a complete makeover which included plastic surgery, dyeing her hair blonder, loosing her Texas accent. She even had to alter her walk and posture and buying fashionable clothes. It looked good at the time, 
but little did she know her decision would have some negative impacts in her future. Soon after her complete transformation, she was noticed at the Players' Ring Theater during one of her performances by a talent scout. She was invited to a screen test that became successful, and she landed a six-month contract with Paramount Pictures. It was a dream come true for her. Her family was so elated that her mother was reported to have shed tears of joy, while her grandparents were simply ecstatic about the achievement. As much as Carolyn wanted to break into the film industry, she harbored resentment over her new look, as it played a huge role in getting her there. She would touch on this years later, when she leapt at the opportunity to act in a Dr. Kildare episode because she strongly identified with the character. It was the story of a woman who undergoes nose surgery and then experiences existential fury when she begins to attract the interest of all the same guys who had previously rejected her former self. After she signed the contract at Paramount, Carolyn made her big screen debut in 1952's aptly named The Turning Point, the film which ironically marked a change in her career. Naturally, her family was thrilled. Unfortunately, Carolyn was in for a big disappointment. She wasn't making as much as she thought she would and was now in a financial strain, and her sister Bet had to move in with her so they could share the rent. Moving closer to complete ruin, she was forced to take on desperate measures. She also opted to act at the theater and wasn't getting the roles she wanted. She was given only two roles before her contract with Paramount expired. Disappointed and frustrated, Carolyn took on any insignificant role that came her way. She soon started to act in television programs. She was casted in the television program Gruen Playhouse in 1952 and TV series Dragnet in 1953. Then her luck shone again as she secured a role in a 3D movie, House of Wax, in 1953, enacting the role of Kathy Gray, a woman who is converted to a Joan of Arc statue. Carolyn was appreciated for her performance and she garnered excellent reviews. It was a big deal, because at that time, House of Wax was the second 3D film ever to be filmed. It marked a significant path in her career, and for the first time, she was noticed by movie reviewers. It was around this time she met Aaron Spelling. Carolyn knew what she had with Aaron was true and honest. They both shared a lot in common. They were both highly ambitious, both were struggling in their careers, and had a great sense of humor. She anxiously waited for his proposal, but Aaron was stalling. He was an aspiring writer and was not financially stable or even ready to start a family. Although he did love Carolyn and wanted to be with her. So she took matters into her own hands and did something that was rare for women to do in the 50s. She proposed to Aaron and the couple got married. Little did she know she wasn't fully prepared for a marital life. Carolyn wasn't ready to be like the typical 1950s housewives. She wanted to focus on her career and the thought of having children just wasn't for her. Personally, she didn't want to have children for the sake of having them. She knew deep in her heart they would be second to her career, a decision she would pay for in Futura. Professionally, she featured in Alfred Hitchcock Press's anthology series in the Chenevasi episode, where she acted as a secretary who assists her boyfriend in an attempted art theft. She was finally receiving the fame and attention she has so long craved for. A Columbia casting executive scouted her for the role of Loreen Alma in what turned out to be the biggest picture of the year, From Here to Eternity. He had promised her that after a successful screen test, the role would be hers. She was elated, as she had always played minor roles up until now, and this would be her first major role. However, disaster was just around the corner. The evening before the screen test, she came down from a serious bout of pneumonia and a 104-degree fever. She was rushed to the hospital that evening as she was close to losing her life. Carolyn obviously would miss out on the screen test and lost the role to Donna Reed, who later won an Oscar award for that part. This completely crushed Carolyn. The thought that she could have been the one in that shoe was a heartache to her. Scared she was fading away, 
she took on another daring step. Struggling to be noticed again, she took up just any kind of role that came her way. Roles that were not prestigious were from here to eternity. And she did score herself a role in the The Bachelor's Party. The role demanded a complete change of her looks. She had to cut her hair drastically short and dye it black to look fit for the role she's to play. The audiences loved it. She became glamorous and alluring overnight. She was being noticed. Although she had only eight minutes to film, her performance was thrilling and impressive. Critics gave her rave reviews and was sought out by interviewers. She was also nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. She was getting what she wanted, but she was in for another disappointment. When the D-Day finally came, she lost that precious golden statue to another actress, Miyoshi Umeki, who took home the Academy Award. Carolyn had to be content with the bittersweet honor of just getting nominated. Still, this only made her more scrappy about her success. And in 1958, Carolyn got her biggest opportunity yet, a movie with Elvis Presley. But it didn't quite go the way she expected. It seemed nature just wasn't on her side because every time she got a big hit, she fell terribly sick. This was the case with this movie with Elvis Presley as she was down with a fever. It's just that she got to keep this role, which meant that Elvis got the esteemed privilege and joy of sharing his romantic scenes with an extremely sick person. At that time, Elvis was kind of a big deal, and the movie, King Creole, was going to be his last film before joining the army. During filming, she felt she would throw up that she refused to kiss Elvis, but he had a sense of humor about it and said, that's all right, maybe it'll get me out of the army. The movie turned out to be another blockbuster, but her reaction wasn't what you would expect. At 34 years of age, it seemed like everything in her life was dwindling. Unknown to her, she would soon land the greatest role of her life. 1960, Carolyn still had yet to make the big leap to leading lady, which she fervently wanted. To make matters worse, the media frenzy surrounding her started to fade and her job offers shrank. Strangely, as her prospects dwindled, her husband's writing career surged, and Aaron unexpectedly became the more successful of the two. The sudden imbalance in their careers disheartened Caroline and put a strain on their relationship. Slowly, their marriage began to fail. As frustrated as she was, Caroline went right into the Hollywood lifestyle, convincing herself that she owed it to her fans to live glamorously. She and her husband soon started the construction of a crazy 13-room mansion, complete with deep baths, a tennis court, and, amazingly, a soda fountain. Carolyn also changed her wardrobes and stocked them with furs and started accessorizing with high-end jewels. But soon enough, there was trouble as Aaron started keeping out late at night without any good reason, and it just wasn't working between them any longer. They got divorced in August 1964. Carolyn felt her world would stop abruptly. Carolyn had always only wanted to become a movie star, so she paid little attention to television series. But everything changed when an intriguing offer for a leading lady's role on daytime TV caught her eye. It would be an understatement to say the role piqued her interest. Quirky, dark and comedic, the part seemed custom-made for her. She joined the cast of The Addams Family as the iconic Morticia. Casts of the show included Carolyn as matriarch Morticia, John Astin as her husband, Gomez, Lisa Loring and Ken Weatherwax as their children, Wednesday and Pugsley Adams. Blossom Rock as Gomez's mother, Grandmama, Jackie Coogan as Uncle Fester, and Ted Cassidy as zombie butler, Lurch. However, it followed suit with a ton of controversy. When The Adams Family originally aired on September 18, 1964, many viewers criticized her blatant romantic chemistry between her character, Morticia, and her on-screen husband, Gomez. It was a very hard role to play because she has to look like the drawings, as did everybody else on the show, but she also had to have a smoldering <laughs> that was very uncommon on 60s television. In general, never mind sitcoms. 
Morticia and Gomez's brazen romance hit conservative audiences like a sack of rocks. Gomez actually used to kiss Morticia's arms, such a scandal, but the chatter surrounding her on-screen romance was nothing compared to her tribulations with Morticia's distinctive dress. Even Carolyn said, I followed the directions I received on the first day of shooting to play Morticia just like Donna Reed. The gown was so tight she could hardly walk properly in it. It takes her about 20 minutes to pull it off after filming. Because of the difficulty she was facing wearing the dress, the designer had to sew a Velcro into the back of the dress to make it more comfortable to wear and pull, and also to walk around in it. After all, it was all worth it. Though it wasn't exactly the glamorous film career she'd always wanted for herself, the show gave Carolyn the level of stardom she had always desired. The Adams family quickly became a household name, and at 35 years old, she achieved mega-celebrity status with legions of followers. It was a dream come true, and Carolyn loved every minute of it. The concept of the Adams family was to take a typical American sitcom and give it a macabre twist, looking at some other reviews about Carolyn on the show. One said, the actress really did enjoy the concept of the show and her character. It was something that she could very much relate to. An observer stated, Morticia had a sense of humor, and there are little things that I know they wove into the dialogue because of her input. He added, the was surprising. Had she not been so well versed in her craft, Carolyn would have not been able to pull Morticia Adams off. Despite the show's popularity, it was brought to an abrupt end in 1966, and Carolyn mourned the loss of her beloved role. She had put in great efforts into the show and didn't expect it to end just after two seasons. After the show was cancelled by ABC, she appeared as a guest actor for over a year in movie roles. Carolyn had a sneaking suspicion. Everyone expected her to always portray Morticia Adams. She'd become so synonymous with the character that watching her portray any other role except Morticia just wasn't the same anymore. Things were becoming difficult for her, and she had to go back to her roots. One place she knew no one, one would expect her to be Morticia Adams. The theatre. Although she managed to secure a role for herself on the Broadway play, the homecoming, in the end, she disliked every second of it. She was so miserable she took irrational decisions at love. Feeling bitter, she decided to turn to her vocal coach, Herbert Greeny, for solace. They soon got intertwined with one another, and they eventually tied the knot in December 1968, making it her third marriage. Many of her friends disapproved of her relationship with Herbert, he didn't have a good humor and wasn't nice. But the worst of it is that he somehow convinced Carolyn to quit acting and move away with him to Palm Springs, which she did. It took her seven years before she realized the joy she had left behind in order to satisfy her husband. She missed acting, and even though she knew it would be hard to restart her career at age 46, she was determined to do it. So, she ended her unhappy marriage and returned to L.A., where she slowly came back to life. Thankfully, the spotlight hadn't forgotten her. She successfully returned to screen after a lengthy break. She appeared as a guest star and also did theatrical performances. During this time, she started writing a sex novel out of boredom for other novels. She claims the women who wrote the novels she read weren't being honest. The novel started because I was sick of novels by inhibited women who didn't know what they were talking about. Books you couldn't believe because they were so utterly dishonest. I decided to show them up, but the deeper I got into my put-on, the deeper I got into myself, my own problems. Most members of Hollywood were displeased with the novel. According to a report, it was a thinly disguised indictment of Hollywood, and because it was so sexual, it also sort of spoiled the image some people had, because Morticia, even though she's sexy, she's also subtle with it, and there's no subtlety in this book. I think it offended Hollywood more than the general public, because they could recognize themselves in this book. 
It had some success, mostly out of curiosity, but it really didn't do her career any favors. A year later, Carolyn said, several people stopped talking to me because of it. Some are insulted because they're not in the book and some because they are, she added. So the book turned out not to be a joke, but the most serious project I've ever attempted. I found I didn't miss acting. I got my jollies, if you will, in the feeling of communicating directly with the audience with nothing in between, no camera, no crew, no devices, just me and the reader. However, it seems Carolyn always found love. Astonishingly, her work in theatre led her to romance again when she fell head over heels for her castmate, Peter Bailey Britton. Regrettably, she had no idea that the sands of time were already sinking. Carolyn became severely sick on a plane flying from Dallas to Los Angeles. She had barely entered the restroom before she vomited a large chunk of blood. She didn't know what was happening to her. Immediately her plane landed, she was rushed to the hospital emergency ward and the doctors performed a quick surgery on her and removed much from her stomach. At first she thought it was ulcer but was later diagnosed with colon cancer, which shocked her very much. The 51-year-old decided not to tell anyone about it and went for chemotherapy and surgery in secret that both proved to be agonizing and painful. Acting was her whole life and she was adamant that she'd never give it up for anything ever again. In pain but still undeterred, Carolyn continued to act on Capitol. Then, after her cancer spread and she became too frail to disguise her sickness any longer, Carolyn resorted to acting from her wheelchair to complete her scenes for the season. She decided to make the most of the little she has left here on earth by surrounding herself with so much. In a bit she married her heartthrob, Peter Bailey Britton, in September 1982. Wanting to look beautiful for her special occasion, she wore a lace and ribbon cap to cover her head because of her hair loss. The wedding was admired by friends, colleagues and well-wishers. Some were even shocked to find out just how true to her character she was. Carolyn was a force of nature, and her castmates knew it. Looking at her, anyone would argue that she was even at this point in ill health. Nicholas Walker, who played her stepson on Capitol, once commented, The pluck and courage that lady has is amazing. That week was heck for her. They cut her open on Monday and she was back on set on Friday and Saturday. On Sunday she was standing at the altar. Carolyn went into a coma in July 1983 at her home in West Hollywood, California, before dying on August 3, 1983. She was 53 years old at the time. After the cremation of her body, a memorial ceremony was conducted on August 5th at Glasband Villain Mortuary in Altadena, California. Ever thoughtful, Carolyn made arrangements to donate her Morticia outfit and wig to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences before died. UCLA later received a collection of Adams Family scripts from her widower, making sure that no one will ever forget her. Perhaps the skin-crawling fact about Carolyn was apart from her ability to survive the Great Depression and controversial childhood. She went through the most horrible moments of her life by herself, keeping it from her fans underneath that long black gown.